The more you build in these safeguards, the bigger the number of people you need, and the more difficult it is. Okay, so often, in, in my case with the class there I have to start, I've got 16 students, what can I do with 16 subjects? I can't make it very complicated because I'm going to get down to just two subjects per variable combination, not going to work. If I've got 500, hey, I could do tons of stuff, but it takes me 10 years to analyze the data. <laughs> Should we do the fast one first or the slow one first? It doesn't matter. All the experiments have done the slow and then the fast. But we don't know what happens if you go the other way. Hopefully, we would test it by reversing the order and find no significant difference. If we do find some significant difference, then we're in trouble, we have to explain why. Here's an example of a very simple test that you can do. <laughs> Topic, hmm, research question, I wonder if you drink wine while you're translating, what happens? Okay, hypothesis, the more wine the subject consumes, the more creative the translation becomes. <laughs> Interesting, yes, I think. Five willing final year master's students who drink wine. We have a problem. Some people drink a lot of wine and it has no effect, and some people drink half a glass and they're screaming. So we might have to do some testing prior to the experiment to see who handles the wine and how to You're welcome to do this. So. Method. Subjects translate the first chapter of Cannery Row into their L1, your main language. Consuming one glass of Yellowtail Cabernet Sauvignon 2011. We're not spending a lot of money on this experiment. <laughs> per five minutes of translation time. So some of you are going to have to work, you know, it's like... This may, be, may get in the way of the typing process, so we could do one of these tube things. No, no. <laughs> the translation is saved after each five minute period. This, so so you, can't go, when, you can't go back and mess up when you're really drunk, otherwise you could go back and revise the beginning. And, and, so we have to save it as you go along. And we do that for 20 minutes. So we get four translations or translation fragments and we compare them for creative shifts. <coughs> Good methodology. Pretty simple one, I think. Expected results. The last translations will have significantly more creative shifts than the first translation. And then the last translations will have significantly more typos than the first translation. So you're going to be more creative, but make, make more mistakes. Well, or not. Who knows? It could be like time pressure. Some people get better with time pressure. Some people get better with wine for a while. <laughs> Expected benefits. Translators will be more creative happier and should know when to stop drinking. This piece of knowledge will be socially useful. Okay. And you have to justify, seriously, you have to justify research. It's got to be a benefit to someone. Uh, because you're using resources, probably money, at least your time and your subjects to do the research. Good. That's an example of basic research design. It could be one page. Okay, but it has to hold together. I think it's an interesting thing. Why is it? Who's it going to benefit to start with? People who employ translators are very interested because they're going to make more money. If you go faster, productivity raised then it's higher, and so more money for your employers. The people who uh, make the tools have more productivity. Translators are going to have more nervous breakdowns and not get any money from it. Or they can realize that they can go faster and make sure they get the rewards of their productivity. Okay? And researchers are going to have some juicy new problems. I have had, when doing this research seriously, not what we do in class, is just fun in class, but um, I've had people, translators, object and say they don't want to 
participate in the experiment, even when we pay them to come and do the experiment, because they say um, this will simply um, result in translators being paid less money. Uh, they, they, they take an ethical stance to take all this research, all this technology is raising the productivity of translators, but we can see the more our productivity is raised, uh, at least in Europe and, and South America, the price you'll pay per word is declining. And so, so I've had some people just refuse to take part in any experiment that's going to go along that way. And my argument as a researcher will say, look, I'm just giving you the knowledge. You use that knowledge to go out and renegotiate with your clients. But you're better off having that knowledge than not. What happens under time pressure? Well, let's think. Could be more errors. Could be less communicative quality. The text is going to lack something, perhaps. You're going to get more money. Somebody should get more money. If you're doing the same thing in less time, somebody's going to get some economic rewards. Are you going to get more or less job satisfaction? Interesting question. Probably less. But we don't know. And is everybody going to handle this the same way? And as you'll see in a minute, that's the key question. Some people handle it in some ways, and others in other ways. So these are the sort of issues we're going to have to think about around the question of benefits of our knowledge. It's not easy. The general finding of most of the research that we're going to see is that when you're put under 30%, when you do the translation at 30% less than your normal time, there may be no significant loss of text quality. Okay? That is, you can go 30% faster and not get worse. Which is why I use 30% in the experiments that I do. Here are some experiments. De Roos was a doctoral thesis, 2003. Um, oh, from memory, his was the first, I think, he had a series of uh, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Something ridiculous. So the last experiment you're trying to do in 5 minutes what you originally did in 20 minutes. And people just explode, you know. <laughs> people walk out and get, get angry. Uh, so the, the, a rather more elaborate design. Um, but by the time you got to ten, the 10 minute frame, uh, 15 in regard to 10, okay, he found that 90.4% of the students produced better translations. So it was about 20%. One in five gets better. 20% is one in five, okay, which is interesting. But then 25% um, uh, had the same quality. But that means that if you had 20 to 25, 45, 55% got worse. So, you know, it's a bit of a mess. You can't, you can't go on television and say, one in five people got better, no, because four in five got worse. It's, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, but it was inconclusive, because there were so many other variables happening at, at the time. Hansen, uh, doing a process analysis, um, found um, that a long orientation phase, that is, prior to when you start writing the translation, uh, does not necessarily result in a translation product of high quality. She found that people who didn't really prepare the translation well did a translation of fairly high quality. Uh, this is interesting for what you're going to see later on, because now I'm looking at the parts of it. Lorenzo, uh, these people work in Copenhagen, Hansen, Lorenzo. Um, she was looking at revision at students revising students' work. And she found that for a lot of the students, when she gave them double the time to revise, the quality got worse. Okay, because they spent too long on the text, they, they, they didn't see the whole of the text. Uh, so this is just indication that um, long initial preparation may not improve your translation, and a long revision time may not improve your translation. 
and to study to get partial observations that might help. And Gebarov, um, who's actually a student of mine, has done an experiment and she was looking at post editing of uh, empty output and she found that the people who went s slower uh, did not produce better work. That the post, for post editing as well, uh, people who went faster generally were better. Not always, but were generally better. So these are just partial in indications of what we might expect to happen. That is, quicker, we, we, under time pressure, we would expect quicker or shorter preparation phase, shorter revision time, and uh, shorter post-editing, post-editing reactions. Okay? That is, from looking at the research hold, we just get the general idea that what's going to happen in your cognitive load is not regular. People under time pressure, we think, might shift their work from some activities to other activities. Yeah? Oh, it's a big mess. <laughs> Quality is, is just such a mess. Yeah, okay, um, there are many things that have been done in the research. Uh, I think, look, oh, I have to remember, I have to go back. I think Deroos gave it to three translation teachers to grade. Okay? Other people give it to translation teachers and to people in the industry to grade. And that's really interesting because the translation teachers pick up all these errors that the industry people seem to think are okay. It's embarrassing. You know, that this what quality means in the industry, what quality means in the educational institution, big mess. Um, for Gebarov, she used the Lisa Grid, Localization Industry Standards Association, now defunct, but it has a grid of assessing you know, points off for that degree of error, points off for that degree of error. You can do that. The one I, I'm using now, um, which I really like, is um, I, get it, I give it to a professional reviser, the corrector, reviser, reviewer if you want, somebody who, who just fixes up text, edits it, not looking at the source, and um, we see how long he, it's a man that we use, how long he takes on each text. That is, we assume he gets all the text up to the same quality, just how long does it take? And so that for me is, a, is a, an industry relevant measure of quality. But quality is a whole, whole debate. Shouldn't have mentioned. Okay, this is where I wanted to get. By looking at some of the prior research, I get the idea that what I'm going to find isn't just a question of quality, it's a question of people shifting their, their work from one phase to another. Here's, I think this was two years ago in the class. They've got Koreans, KKK, Chinese, tons of you. I had, and I had three French students in that class, which was great fun for me, because I could, I could actually work with that language. Uh, now, what you're seeing here, uh, the phases, there's the preparation or reading, how long they spent on documentation, that is, looking things up, googling, the actual writing, we're calling that drafting, and the reviewing is what we're calling um, the revising they do after they finish the translation. Okay? So they did it, this is going from 20 to 13 minutes. The 250 word text, and the plus and minus are, I think, the differences in seconds. So, we get to the end and we find that um, most of the subjects here have gone faster, have, have, uh, have gone faster overall, okay? have gained time, and we can see where they've gained time. If you look at the totals, you would say they've taken time away from the reading, away from the documentation, away slightly from the revision, and the percentage, the, the gain is in the actual 
translation. So how, overall, if you look at the total, we can say, how did they go faster? Well, they cut out the peripheral activities. They, they reduced on those particular activities to focus on them. Fair enough. But if you now look at each subject, you'll find that they're just radically different. Okay? K2, who was a crazy Korean guy, who is nameless, and no longer here, so. Um, and everybody else, look, plus nine, plus two, you know, he went minus 23 on the reading. What? And plus 33 on the reviewing. He's just doing the reverse of everybody else. And doing the reverse of what he did in the first experiment. Because I'm comparing the times of the first with the second. So he was one person in the first and just became a completely different beast in the second. Which is why he's in shape there. Okay? And F2 took longer in the first. No, it took longer in the second than the first. They said, oh yeah, because the first one, the first one was a subject I knew really well and loved. You know, so he just went straight through. So the experiment was a complete disaster for him because of the, the text variable. Okay, you want two texts that are neutral, but he happened to get one that was just a subject he knew everything about. He didn't have to look anything up, he just translated it straight off. Okay, so he's out. And you can do that. You can get outliers and say, look, for exceptional circumstances, these people, I'm sorry, they're not in my sound for, for whatever reason. Okay? Even if you look at the others, you'll find that they're radically different. There's not one type. I can look at the totals, but the standard deviations are too high for these to be significant. The basic idea is, we found that the people were so different under time pressure that it's very hard to get one clear solution from it. Um, what happened from that class was actually interesting uh, because at the end I asked the students to write up, to, to say what their experience was of going under time pressure. And they did the analysis themselves. If you're in that class, you know I get you to analyze yourselves. And, um, you know, I, I've got the... I don't, I'm not going to get to that. And one of the girls, actually F3 over here, looked at it and she said, you know, the second time I did it, it was really hard for me to separate the categories. Ah. And I went back to the screen recordings. The basic method here is screen recording, and you play it back and you can see what... And she was right. For all these people, I discovered that in the first activity, when they had lots of time, the phases were fairly distinct. And in the second activity, they were mixed. They were blended. One went into the other. People knew they were going to have time to revise at the end, so they did lots of reviewing as they were going along. People uh, didn't spend a lot of time reading, but when they had to read, they went and did it in the middle of it. And we discovered, thanks to her, look, that first that, that the one effect everybody had was a blending of cognitive activities. Okay, and that worked. What was worrying was that the methodology I was using required the activities to be separated. That is, I was imposing a methodology that was hiding the one thing that was valuable to find. And so, to turn that into a valid experiment, I had to learn from my subject and go back and analyze all the data again. And I just looked at overlapping activities. I looked at where people went from one to the other and back to one. You know, in these things. And I found that time pressure gives greater blending. Wasn't what I set out to achieve, wasn't what my methodology was designed to locate, it was something that we discovered in the process of doing the experiment. And so you go back and do another experiment with a new hypothesis, and that's how science goes on.